So I'm going to introduce Professor Agnes Park, who is um, Professor uh, of uh, Applied Linguistics and the founder and director of the Center for Multilingual and Intercultural Communication here at Stony Brook. She is also currently the chair of the Department of Asian and Asian American Studies at Stony Brook. She has a long and distinguished academic pedigree, but if I recited all of that, she wouldn't have any time to introduce the speaker who would not have any time to speak. So, <laughs> Professor Huff. Thank you, Professor Mangarnov. Um, I'll be brief so that our speaker will have ample time to talk to us. Our speaker today is Dr. Lourdes Ortega, who is a professor in the Department of Linguistics from Georgetown University. She's also the convener of the Initiative for Multilingual Studies there. Professor Ortega was educated in, listen carefully, Spain, Germany, and the US, and she received her PhD from the University of Hawaii. She also has extended working experience as a uh, teacher of Spanish in Greece. Um, so her life path has given her a different dominant language at different stages in her life. Uh, Spanish, German, modern Greek, and English. And actually I will be surprised that her next dominant language is Chinese because one of her books has just been translated into Chinese. Uh, Professor Ortega has received many honors. She was a recipient of the Pimsleur and the TESOL Research Awards in 2000, uh, a doctoral medal, medal fellowship in 1999, a postdoctoral fellowship from Spencer and National Academy of Education in 2003, a senior research fellowship at the Freiburg Institute of Advanced Studies, and currently she is a distinguished visiting fellow at CUNY Graduate Center. She's also the past editor of Language Learning, a key journal for five years, uh, and she serves on the editorial boards of many key journals in applied linguistics. Her research interests include second language acquisition, usage-based linguistics, second language writing, systematic research synthesis, and ep epistemology and ethics in applied linguistics. Um, Epistemology meaning how do we come to know what we know, and ethics is about what is right, what is wrong, right? So she has published the most extensively, and her CV is 36 pages long. Yes, you heard me right, 36 pages long. So uh, I would simply say that, say this, in the field of applied linguistics today, Professor Ortega is a leading voice of creativity, clarity, and, as you will hear, conscience. So please join me in welcoming Professor Lourdes Ordena. Thank you, Agnes, for such a wonderful introduction. Uh, exaggerated, but I appreciate it too. I'm going to see, can I see you all? Can I see my PowerPoint better with or without glasses? <laughs> Difficult to know. Okay, if I do like this, then I see better. If I do like this, I see better. Okay. We'll try. And if you start feeling that you cannot hear me well, just go like this with your hands so that I keep my teaching voice up. Yeah? All right. So uh, first, I would like to thank the people who have invited me to be here. I know how long and how much work it takes to organize any talk or any event. I'll be here in the morning with you and in the afternoon in a global forum. And I really, really want to interact with as many students as I can. So I encourage you to come up after the talk or if you see me on campus, stop me and talk to me and tell me who you are. I also want to thank my own university who gave me a sabbatical for this whole semester and the CUNY Graduate Center who gave me a fellowship in New York City and that's how I was able to come to you today. And I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with the references, so I will pass the PowerPoint to uh, 
professor here, but also if you want to email me, you can email me. <coughs> All right, I will start by setting up the scene for my talk with a self-introduction. Agnes already started with that a little bit, but let me tell you that I come originally from southern Spain, and I spent my first 24 years of life there, so I went to college there too, and I grew up as a monolingual for 24 years. I also in between spent though a year in Germany studying uh, at the university in Munich, so again southern Germany, there is a southern theme in my life most of the time. And uh, then um, I went to northern Greece, Greece, where I learned the dialect of modern Greek in, in the northern um, area. And I've been there for seven years and I taught Spanish there. And then I relocated to Hawaii to do my graduate studies. And I spent five plus eight years in Hawaii, first as a student, then as a faculty member in between our work on the U.S. mainland uh, at several universities. So I have lived and taught at universities in Washington, D.C., Georgia, and Arizona, and eventually I went back to Washington, D.C., where I've been for six years and hopefully for much longer. But one never knows, right, how many new lives one is going to have. And if I had to learn another language now, as Professor Herr mentioned, I don't know if it would be Mandarin. It may be Mandarin. It may have to be Arabic, or it may have to be sign language, American sign language, because that would really open up a whole new world to me. Um, using language, but not with sound. But anyway, I don't discard learning more languages and going to more places to have other lives. So I've been a primary user of a non-native language, but not always English, since I was 24 years of age. I've been a primary non-native English user for 25 years of my life. I've been a native and a non-native teacher of languages, Spanish and English. I've taught, and some modern Greek I've taught too, and some German and some Latin I've taught quite a few languages. And I'm a multilingual, and I'm going to talk about multilingualism in this talk. I'm also an SLA researcher. SLA is the name of my field, second language acquisition. So studying how people learn languages once they are out of the family unit, once they are doing school work, or later in life while they are young adults or older adults. What do I mean by multilingual? I do not mean someone necessarily born to more than one language in the family from birth. I certainly do not mean someone who is native-like perfect or who can pass for a native speaker. And I don't even mean perfectly or equally proficient in the languages that we speak. I just mean functionally able to use more than one language for one's own purposes in life. That's a whole thing. So the world is and has always been multilingual although many times in visit this I wonder if there is a way I can make that little icon there disappear. Does anyone know? I'm technologically inclined. If I go like this, will it do it? No, it does. Uh, that's the whole thing. Oh, so don't touch. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So sometimes it will, it will hide something, but that's okay. Okay, so the world is and has always been multilingual, often invisibly. So in the United States, for example, look at the seven top languages that we have spoken at home besides English. So we have 40 million people speaking at home Spanish, but we also have considerably numbers of millions of speakers who do Chinese, Tagalog, Vietnamese, French, Arabic, and Korean at home, in addition to English. And think about this. Official countries in the world, we have about 193, but languages in the world, we have over 7,000 currently. So do the math. How can the world not be anything but multilingual, right? And as an example, a country like Cameroon in Africa has two official languages, English and French, both colonial languages, and it has 286 local languages 
there are only 23 million people. So they are 2% of the whole population of Africa, but they concentrate just in their geography 13% of all the local languages of Africa. And think about this. There are languages that don't exist in any monolingual state. They are only bilingual languages. They have no monolingual speakers. They only have bilingual speakers. One example is Catalan in Spain. Right? We have international migrants, many, many, many of them, right? They are 3.4% of the world population. And, in fact, they would be the fifth most populous country after China, India, United States, and Indonesia. Many of them cross borders, international borders, country borders, and they also have to cross linguistic borders. And that means that they learn new languages and they become multilingual <coughs> if they weren't already multilingual. And we have international students. How many international students do we have here in the audience? Raise your hand. Okay, not too many right now. Um, international students are a very important portion of all higher education enrollments worldwide. Do you think you can make disappear? Or move it, yeah. Move it down. Perfect. You don't need any of these icons. No. Thank you so much. I thought for a second I was going to be told no one can hear you. <laughs> All right. So uh, the international students worldwide are a really large portion of higher education enrollment. And in the United States, they are 30% of all enrollments for uh, United States wide, so country wide. And particularly in the United States, as of 2016, it was exactly 1 million of international students and 5% of the higher education body. But multilingualism has also forever been contested. And remember the myth of Babel, the Tower of Babel, where humankind was punished with the gift of languages, which was the confusion of languages, right? So it's a very negative story when it comes to multilingualism and bilingualism, right? It was a punishment of God to confuse humanity for their hubris. Particularly now, we are having very difficult times. We're living very difficult times. Compare the goals of the UNESCO. By 2030, they want to end poverty, promote peace, share wealth, and protect the planet. These are very serious goals. Lots of countries and governments are working towards them through the UNESCO. But at the same time, what's on the rise in the world? Well, lots of conflict and war, non-solidarity, anti-diversity, anti-immigration, anti-welfare state, and populism. So I think for some slides, the size is going to be off with regard to the screen, but you have to guess the bottom of the screen. In language learning, inequities manifest themselves in whose multilingualism is accepted and praised, whose multilingualism is viewed as a problem, and whose multilingualism remains completely invisible. You hear some people saying, I'm learning Mandarin, I'm learning Arabic, and you get so much admiration from others, right? And someone says, oh, I am a speaker of English as a second language or an additional language, and all we get is criticism for not being perfect or for appreciation or for a little things that are off on the humanity. No admiration to the many, many millions of speakers of English as a second language and additional language, right? So for some people, they're multilingual and they're admired, supported, and celebrated for that. For other people, they're criticized, they're put down, and their multilingualism is viewed as a problem, as a difference that causes problems to them and to society. And a lot of other multilingualism remains completely invisible. Many multilinguals in marginalized communities constantly experience their multilingualism as a burden rather than a fact of life, all along while many multilinguals with more privilege are able to experience it as a romanticized and commodified gift 
that adds to their privilege. How willing and how able are researchers of multilingualism to respond to the present difficult times, not just at the personal level and the civic level, but also with their own research? So I want to put in your head the idea that research can address social justice. And social justice is very, very simply defined as the goal to decrease human suffering and to promote human values of equity and dignity. When it comes to multilingualism, it's simply making sure that learning languages is possible without inequity and indignity, and that being able to speak many languages, to use the languages as you want to use them for your purposes, is possible without criticism, without oppression without squashing languages down in the lives of individuals, families, communities. So, let me talk a little bit about inequitable multilingualism. Bilinguals and multilinguals frequently experience oppression because they're being positioned by others as a novice, a foreigner, an outside member, or an unnamed speaker. And they're being told that their language is not good enough. Look at this uh, quote from a student of mine, a graduate student. I cited information from this person. This person wrote, I did not think I was weak in my grammar, but when I got comments from a lot of professors about my grammar, I still feel I'm not a legitimate academic writer. Their comments make me to think I'm not academically appropriate, but still need to go two years of English classes to fix my grammar. I feel often I'm a long-term patient in a hospital to get a 10-year-long surgery. A pretty upset graduate students. And if you think of children, some of them will experience their bilingualism harmoniously, but others conflict with them. So what do we mean by harmonious bilingualism? Simply, growing up with more than one language in the family is from stress not as a life birth. Yeah. So this is the picture that uh, the drawing that a nine-year-old heritage Portuguese speaker in Germany drew when asked to draw yourself speaking the language of know. It's a pretty happy <coughs> photo, right? The child is pretty happy just depicting lots of languages in the family, everyone, lots of bubbles with lots of languages, everyone's smiling, everyone is happy. But for another child in the same uh, context, the same class, conflictive bilingualism was very evident. So here is the drawing from a 10-year-old. And you see the child alone, isolated, at home, with rain and thunder and storm. And then the flags, you have the lower flag, is the German flag, the upper flag, is the Portuguese flag. So in the upper part of the drawing, we see lots of extended family. Everyone is happy. The sun is out in the sky. So this child obviously is relating Portuguese back in the originary country with happiness, social support, lots of people, sun, and the present life with German in Germany as isolated, sad, rainy. That's conflictive bilingualism when a child has to draw these. And there are systemic structural forces stacking the deck against certain groups more than others. So is it just about language? When we learn language, when we use language, when we are multilinguals or we want to become multilinguals, is it just a matter of language when we face oppression? Sometimes it is. There is linguism, right? But it's also about race and ethnicity, racism. And it's about class, occupation, and wealth, and religion, and sex, and age, and sexual orientation. All of these things cause difference that is negatively viewed, and all of them intersect with language or languages, right? So it's never just about a matter of learning language or using language. Who is a legitimate speaker of a language? It's someone who not only sounds it, but also looks it. Who do, who do I look and what do I speak? They're very related in the perception of others. And so others talk to us depending on how we sound, but also how we look. And the isms included in how we look and how we sound are inescapable. 
Let me give you an example from a study by Samini in 2008, already many years ago. Uh, Mark, a white American who grew up in Michigan, Florida, and the Midwest, and yet learned Arabic and became super, super good, super competent with Arabic, right? And here's what he says in one of the interviews with the researcher. He noticed that he gets huge compliments when Arabs will stare at me confused, simply stare and then say, this just doesn't add up. I see your face and features, but your tongue is Arabic. Because it's white, but he speaks great Arabic. And other people stare at him. But then he also acknowledges that these are also backhanded compliments because when the native speakers tell him, oh my God, how can you speak so well? Look at him and how he can speak better than we can. What this really means is you can never know the language. It's ours. You're the other, an outsider. And your hair and eye color will always give you away. So this is a white American person getting really good at Arabic and noticing all these things in his daily interactions now that he's a very competent Arabic. The opposite is also true. <coughs> so in another study by Seymour Jorn, uh, Mahmoud, a Palestinian American heritage language student, remembered with embarrassment an incident while visiting family in Palestine. This is what the person said. His cousins took him to lunch in Ramallah. He was handed a menu and asked to order from it, but he could not read it. He commented to the researcher that since he looks, looks exactly like his cousins, people assume he knows Arabic. And he was very embarrassed when he could not read the menu. This incident was his reason for enrolling in modern standard Arabic courses at the university. And the researcher really talked to a lot of Arabic students in college who were of Arab uh, descent, and she summarized the situation in this way. They said, they all said, it's just too hard to look Arab and not have Arabic proficiency. So that's why I'm studying the language. And a final example from another study to here in Canada. This is Gurjit, a first grader Punjabi Sikh uh, Canadian, who overheard these comments from classmates in first grade. Don't go to Sujit's birthday. It would be Indian smell. And then the researcher observed Sujit covering her ears and turning away. This same thing didn't happen ever in the two to three years observation that the researcher did in the same first grade class to Julie, who was also an immigrant from Poland and whose English was also not at all very advanced. And indeed, race and language social preferences emerge already around ten to age five, and they're consolidated by age ten. So really, really young children can already develop these racist attitudes. So there are complex, difficult relationships between language learning and globalization, immigration, conflict, poverty, colonialism, white supremacy. And we can have people who live their bilingualism and multilingualism harmoniously, but others who live it conflictively. And we need to understand privilege and vulnerability if we want to study and understand what the capacity for the human language is and what multilingualism means to people. Am I exaggerating? <laughs> It all depends on your own personal experience in life. Yeah? So some of us may think, oh, that's too exaggerated. But then we have to examine our privilege and whether we have gone through similar experience to the people who complain about the oppression they become through their life. OK. I am going to uh, talk a little bit about grassroots multilingualism, which is gradient. So, Elite multilingualism would be when we have enough privilege to, cho to choose to learn a language, to choose to use the languages that we want to use, and to get praise and approval and support for it, versus grassroots multilingualism, 
which means that we have less privilege and we are engaged in language learning of a certain special kind. So, an example is in Africa town in Wanzhou, China. This is a commercial area where since the 1990s there have been many immigrants from West Africa and they are business owners and they work at, at businesses and also lots of immigration within China, internal immigration. And I am focusing on Laura, a grassroots multilingual migrant in her mid-30s in a study by Kwame Han. And she had to move from Sichuan, where she was born, to Wanzhou. So this is quite a bit of a distance within China. It's about 1,200 kilometers or 700 plus, 700 plus miles. I live in DC, it would be a distance like from DC to Chicago, moving from DC to Chicago. And yet by moving that distance, she actually had grown up with her Sichuan dialect and she had to add Mandarin, Cantonese, and English to her life just with that move within China. And here is a quote for how she describes how she learned English already as an owner of a shop. She said, I taught myself English. I learned a little in school, but forgot all of it. How are you? I wrote that down in Chinese. How are you? And this was how I learned. When I started my first shop, I sublet half of it to two good-looking young women who could speak English. First, to share the rent, and secondly, I could ask them for help with English. But when I, had, when I had customers, they refused to help. You should hire a translator. So I was very upset and started to learn secretly. Whatever they said, I wrote down and memorized. Gradually, I learned. I can understand and speak, but I cannot write. I actually have taught a few other young women English, because many of them are from the countryside and never went to school, so they could not read and write. This is grassroots. But if we think of how to study Laura's language development or her language competencies or her communicative repertoires, it's very difficult for researchers to imagine how to start making sense and putting order, research order, into the way she uses and speaks her languages and how she's learned her languages. There is also the problem of not knowing how to study people who are bilinguals of a kind that is unfamiliar to us. So this is a very uh, uh, famous study of bilingualism in the 60s and the early 60s in Canada, where the initial pool was 364 10-year-old children from six Montreal French schools. So 75 of them were tested and identified as monolinguals because they had uh, only French and no English, right? Another 89 were identified as bilinguals because when they were tested, they really know and they knew a lot of French and a lot of English. But then 200 were suddenly excluded from the study. 200. Why? Because the researchers said, well, they were not equally skilled in French and English, and they could not be really unambiguously classified as either monolingual or bilingual. Right? So then they decided to exclude them. So this is a 55% exclusion in a study. You test everyone, these are clearly monolinguals, these are clearly bilinguals. Uh, 200 of them, 55 of my participants, I don't know what to do about them. Because they're not clearly one or the other. For the sake of it, let's exclude them. Yeah? So what happens if you get too comfortable studying elite uh, bilinguals and multilinguals and are we going to study the human capacity for language if we study a tiny, tiny thing to isolate and we exclude everyone else? Shouldn't all kinds of bilingualism be researchable or unresearchable? Can we render inconvenient, messy, unfamiliar multilingual competencies? simply excludable from study. This is good science. So for these, we need researchers to actually decide that when focusing on adult language development, we must contribute to the goal of understanding equitable and gradient multilingualism.
It has to be about social justice, and it has to be about an understanding of bilingualism, multilingualism that is realistic. It's gradient. It's not black and white. So I will then present a few strategies that I think researchers can use to study all multilinguals, not just the ones that we have been studying forever and we understand relatively well. Right? So let me give a few strategies. One is, as much as possible, we can collect evidence from multilinguals or languages. Instead of focusing only on their English, so we do a study of English, but they are multilinguals, they have other languages too. But we don't care about the other languages, we only want to study their English. What's the problem anyway there? Why is it so problematic to just choose one of the languages? Well, if we sample and we divide people into native, non-native, monolingual, bilingual, okay? and if we elicit only second language data from them, and if we analyze those second language data and the transcribers and the coders and the raters of the data are not bilingual, they only understand the L2, and then if the constructs that we use and the interpretations that we try to arrive at are designed to explain learning how to behave monolingually in the new language, learning how to use English as if you didn't have other languages in your life. Just kind of like, can this person do it? Can this person learn English later in life and then sound like they don't have other languages in their life? That's kind of like the research purpose if we're only focusing on the one newer language without considering all the other languages that that person has. Think, for example, of heritage speakers. Um, these are the ones who go to study Arabic or Mandarin or Korean or whatever. <coughs> to co in college, they are in their family, they have uh, connections with the language and with the ethnicity and the culture, and they decide to go back and study the language in college. They are the heritage speakers. They're studying for their Korean and Mandarin, right? but not for their English. But then we also have other researchers studying the 1.5 generation, who are exactly the same people. But now we're studying their English. So we have studies that produce a lot of knowledge about the same people, but only their Korean, or their Arabic, or their Mandarin, or their Spanish. And the same people, but only their English. And the two things are never put together. The knowledge is never put together. Right? It's the same people, but we're totally separating everything, so we're, the, the knowledge can never get together, and we cannot actually make sense of it. Yeah? So what's the counter strategy? to study competences, a way of calling it, to focus on the whole system, to focus on all the different languages and resources and repertoires that a person has when they are bilingual or multilingual. Yeah. Because bilinguals are not multilingual, so they cannot be studied as monolinguals. Okay, we can also reframe late timing positively. Don't children learn languages effortless? Unwell. Don't we all wish that we could learn a Mandarin, a Arabic, a Korean, a Spanish as a little kid so that we don't suffer through it? So what's the problem there? Well, there's a real obsession with age and timing in the research. We think that babies do it the best, and then if you're a little bit older, you still will do it okay, but not so good. And then if you're an adult and you start, you're in big trouble. And then if you're a really old adult, then forget it. Don't even bother to try. So there's a lot of ages up here. What's the counter strategy? Well, the research, the latest research, actually contradicts all of it. So with very young children, we have studies showing that if you compare children who started at age one or three, with children who start at age four or seven, there's just no difference. For age, no difference. For the amount of language that they hear and they use, that's the And for children who are in foreign language environments, typical school situation, three hours a week, right? Everywhere in the world, foreign languages, three hours a week. That's it, right? Earlier is no better or worse than later by the end of high school. So if you took French or Spanish or something else in high school for three hours a week, 
whether you started at one age or another or another, it doesn't make any difference. Right? We have the studies to show it. They are amazing. They're longitudinal and they're very clear. Why? Because jazz lowering the starting age won't produce better outcomes by the end of high school. There are other factors in childhood age. And I'm going to skip the factors, but we have the research showing us exactly what matters that is not age or starting age. And adults over 40 years old, when they start learning in the country, so immigrants, you know, they cannot choose at what time they, they cross borders and these borders. Immigrants have to learn the new language whenever they have to. They cannot pick and choose. But it's never too late, the research says. Right? So here's a study, very recent, by Cosa and Yates in Australia. They looked at 24 immigrants, and they had immigrated to Australia between ages 40 and 73. 73, that's pretty late, right? So they wanted to know who made good progress in five years and what were the factors that may explain that. And here's what they found. Those who arrived with better education, 12 or more years of education, and had arrived with better English already, and were very proactive and reported lots of self-directed language learning strategies, and never ever complain about their age or their memory. <laughs> they never made those comments, right? If they had all these four things, they were the ones included the most in the five years. And uh, they were of any age, from 40 to 73, any age. But they had these things. So often, we also have to judge whether we're going to think an adult is Incompetent, incompetent linguistically, or they're just becoming very flexible, very multilingual as they learn. So here's a study with a, a participant, Judith, who was a 20-year-old Hungarian, who was living in Finland, had lived already there for five years, and spoke Finnish well. And she explains this. My friends always laugh at me because I very directly translate a lot of these Hungarian well because in Finnish, you say, for example, to put the cat on the table, to bring up a difficult topic. Well, things like that. I translate from Hungarian to Finnish, literally, and then everybody asks, what do you mean? What is that? But I always tell them that in this situation, I do that on purpose. Of course, I try, especially when I write, not to write like that. But often I enjoy it, that I use language a bit differently, and people get used to it. And I like to tell people about it, that I say it because in Hungarian there's a saying like that. I don't necessarily think that I'm, that's a mistake, because I always explain what I say is that way. So she enjoys using her Hungarian in her Finnish, translating directly, knowing that that's really not how we say it in Finnish. And she enjoys then explaining it to the Finnish friends and making them learn a little bit of Hungarian foods. And she thinks that's should become a mistake. But so often what we hear from foreigners, immigrants, multilingual to speak our language in a slightly different way. So often what we hear is like, oh, they don't know enough. Oh, they don't know it. Oh, they don't know it well. So we have a decision to make. Alright. I am going to Keep a little bit because otherwise we won't finish in time. 53, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, a strategy that we can also use is to focus on experience of language. So experience of a multilingual two or more languages has emerged as a crucial variable in explaining success. In early bilingualism with children, not just with late uh, learners, so in cognitive science, we have a lot of evidence now that the experience trumps age when the two variables are not completed. That is, when we vary the time, so children between the age 0 and 7, and we maintain the proficiency and the exposure comparative in both languages. Then it really shows up that it's the amount, the quality of the language the children use and are exposed to that matters and not the study. We have tons of studies, and I'm often upset that a lot of people in my field don't read these studies because 
that are about children, not about adults. So they can go, we don't care. But if experience of language and environmental affordances shape linguistic success, then the linguistic environment is uh, wanting, not the learners, whether they're children or adults. So if we know that the environment is what's creating such strong differences in degrees of success, then we don't need to blame it on deficiencies of an adult or a child. We can look at the environment first, right? So we shouldn't take the environment for granted, and we should study what I've been calling linguistic duress. Linguistic duress. If I don't know X in the language, is it because my age? Is it because my fault? Is it because my background? Or is it because I haven't had enough opportunity yet to hear it and to learn from it? Right? So what do we know? We have very few studies documenting this for adults. But we know that many adults have very limited access to the second language, even when supposedly they're totally immersed in it. Right? So, in a study in Canada, graduate students arriving in Canada to study in English, their degree, they reported, on average, 11 minutes daily of using English with any friends or any acquaintances. 11 minutes. Is that enough to learn English well or to develop further and further their English? And in other studies, the same thing in the UK, after four months, a lot of uh, international students reported that they had failed to develop and cultivate friends' interactions using English. And if you directly record classes and you see, so how much past tense is in this teacher's uh, talk, the ED, the infamous ED? I walk or I walked yesterday to the store. Right? Very difficult to acquire, actually, for non-English speakers learning English. And yet, if you see and record a classroom, it turns out that the teachers are not using it very much. So how are we going to learn it if we don't hear it around? But careful, because experience is multiple, just like the speakers are multiple. So we're not going to be just studying their English exposure or their Arabic exposure. We have to be studying Contexts where they're going to be mostly using one language, other contexts where other interlocutors and they're going to be using a different la the other language, and then other contexts where they're going to use both languages, either switching orderly between them or mixing them in creative ways. Right? So we can't, again, we can't study the environment monolingually when it comes to multilingual learning because any multilingual is going to have an environment that is also multilingual. So let's check out our facts about experience of language before we assume inherent deficits in learners. I think I'm going to finish with this one and save you from the other recommendations. But this one I want to recommend because I think it's a very helpful idea for researchers and for everyone. Can we view multilingual acquisition as the human default? The problem is that we think of first language acquisition by children, and we think, okay, a child with one language in the family from birth, and then they grow up, and how do they acquire that language? Okay? And then we think of bilingual first language acquisition, and we think, okay, yeah, this is also children, infants from birth, and they have multiple languages in the family, so we study that. Okay? What's wrong with saying, oh, I do first language acquisition? or I do bilingual first language acquisition. What's wrong is that we forget that we should be saying, I do monolingual first language acquisition, because that's what they're doing. But they're forgetting to tell us that, and by the way, I'm only studying monolingual children acquiring their language. And so by saying bilingual first language acquisition, this is made into a very special case. So the default is, I studied child language acquisition, and you forget to say, oh, but that's only monolingual children. Right? But if you study bilingual children, then the bilingual is never dropped. I studied bilingual language acquisition, a special case. But there's nothing special about multilingual. There's just nothing special. For many families, for many individuals, for many communities, it really is a matter of fact, a matter of life, and not a choice. 
Yeah. And the majority of the world, remember, is multilingual. So what would be the country strategy? Think of finding what is multilingualism as the Galapagos Island of language acquisition. Darwin didn't go to the Galapagos Island to study just the Galapagos Island for its sake, right? Not because it was so special, so diverse and interesting, just to understand that environment, those species there, right? He went because he wanted to create a theory of evolution for everything, not just for the Galapagos Islands. So with language acquisition, I think we can actually do the same thing. Bilingual exposure is maximally rich exposure. Because think about it. We hear more sounds and we learn and use more sounds. We hear and learn and use more lexical entries for the same items and concepts. And we are exposed to much greater variability of language. Right? So what if then we think, well, monolingual acquisition is not the richest type of data because exposure is maximal, only one language, 100%, and the variability, the natural variability of language and communication is flattened out. But with bilingual multilingual acquisition, exposure can vary maximally depending on the balances of the languages, the contexts of the languages, the interlocutors of the languages, and so this really yields maximally relevant evidence for language. It's like Studying, trying to study um, the weather and trying to create a theory of climatology by collecting data only from Hawaii. Just this much of a range of temperatures, right? This much of a range of phenomena. So how can I construct then a theory of the entire how the weather works in the world by collecting data only from that? Right? For language acquisition, human capacity for language, how can we really understand if we collect only monolingual acquisition, it's like a complicated range of possibilities of how the brain, the socialization, deals with language and communication and varieties and variabilities of the people. But if we do directly multilingual bilingual acquisition, then maximally diverse, maximally informative data then we can build a theory of language. So, it's the necessary fertile ground to crack. So I'm going to skip the rest of the recommendations so that we all finish on time. And I am going to only say my last words. In my field, we have had a social turn, a multilingual turn we're having now, but I want a social turn as well, a social justice turn as well. So researchers can play safe or risky, but if we do not understand what multilingualism is. And if we do not want to investigate everyone's multilingualism, and if we do not consider that it's not just the new language, the second language, but it's all the language repertoire of the individual, then we may not be advancing our own research. We will need new methods, new strategies, but unless we move in this direction, the research is stagnant. It's not going to be able to the human language, uh, the capacity for human language. So with that, I will finish and I thank you for your attention.